Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for our uh, friends on the East Coast, good morning for those of here on the West Coast. My name is Adriana Galvan, and I'm the co-executive director of the Center for the Developing Adolescent. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on love in adolescence. I'm excited to welcome our panelists, and they will introduce themselves in a few moments. Um, with Valentine's Day approaching, we wanted to engage in a conversation about the important role that romantic relationships play during the adolescent years and how these relationships have been impacted during the COVID-19 pandemic. There's been an important focus on friendships and peer relationships in light of social distancing, but there's been less talk about romantic relationships. And here we're talking about crushes, to dating, to sexual relationships, and even to breakups. These relationships can be important aspects of healthy development in addition to, um, to friendships and other kinds of relationships. Given that most of this learning occurs in the context of peers, what kind of impact are social dis is social distancing and other COVID-related restrictions having on young people's romantic and sexual relationships? We'll also explore how we can support healthy sexual and romantic development now and also when this pandemic is over. These are topics we hope to discuss today with our panelists. Um, so before we get into um, the, the questions, we will have each of our four panelists introduce themselves now. So we'll start with Anna. Hi there, my name is Anna Suleiman and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Public Health at um, California State University, Sacramento. And I have sort of, I've worked in a couple of areas. One, I'm really interested in engaging youth in actually addressing and improving their um, romantic and sexual relationships. do a lot of work in youth engagement. And I've also done a lot of work around trying to translate developmental science to help improve interventions um, for romantic and sexual relationships. And most recently I've been doing a research project where I've been interviewing 10 to 24 year olds about their social relationships during COVID and how the pandemic has affected their friendships as well as their um, romantic relationships and their relationships with adults. Thank you, Anna. Next we have Crystal. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having me. I'm Crystal Tyler. I am the executive director of CI3 at the University of Chicago. And at CI3, we really focus on asset-based interventions for adolescents that really advance their sexual and their reproductive health. And we do that by creating interventions alongside adolescents, so really partnering with them to create interventions and, and tools that really help them and that speak to them and speak to the world that they're living in, the things that they're concerned about, and um, address the issues that they really want to work on. Um, prior to this, I've spent a number of years um, within the, with the federal government at the Centers for Disease Control and working at nonprofit organizations that focus on adolescent health and um, maternal and child health. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Okay, next we have Pam Anderson. Hi, hey everyone. It's very nice to be here with you all today. Um, my name is Pam Anderson. I am a senior research associate at ETR. ETR is a nonprofit organization committed to improving health outcomes and advancing health equity for youth, families, and communities. And for the last 15 years, I've been largely focused on um, looking at the context of adolescent romantic relationships and understanding the impact of these relationships on adolescent health and well being. Thank you. Um, and finally, Stephen Russell. Hi, I'm Stephen. Um, I'm at the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm a professor of human development and family sciences. And I've been studying the health and well-being of LGBTQ young people, lesbian, gay, bisexual, queer, transgender young people for a long time. And uh, one of those areas is their romantic relationship development, understanding themselves in the world, and um, also then their health and well-being in their families and schools. And it's really fun to be on this panel of like-minded friends. Thanks for having me. Wonderful. Completely agree. So uh, all of you can see we have a perfect um, group of people to have this discussion with. Um, before we begin, I want to encourage the audience to please ask questions in the Q&A box. Um, if you can include your name and affiliation, that would be great. And we hope to answer as many questions or comments as we can at the conclusion of our more moderated discussion. Okay, so um, let's get started. We'll be exploring a few themes. The first one is um, to, to any of the panel members, um, what evidence do we have that adolescence is a sensitive window for social learning about romantic and sexual relationships? 
Um, and I know, Anna, you and I have had conversations about this, so maybe we'll start with you. Thanks, Adriana. Um, I think that this is definitely one where there is a lot of concern about thinking about adolescents as sexual beings, but we do have to remember that the biological purpose of puberty is, is sexual maturation. And this is for humans because we also have um, a socially constructed um, sexuality and gender identity that is beyond just our ability to procreate, it involves a lot of learning. And it involves us learning how to navigate the complex social world that we have to, that, that young people are having to explore so that they can build the, uh, the successful social relationships that really allow them to have successful romantic and sexual relationships. And I think that we do know that there's really um, interesting and exciting changes that are happening in the brain that encourage young people to like and want the highly arousing social um, exchanges that happen in romantic relationships, that feeling of having your first crush, of finding somebody attractive, of sometimes finding out that somebody's not attractive, that they like you, but you don't like them. Figuring all that out is really critical learning that young people need to do during this time. Yeah. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of research on adolescents themselves to understand that you know, how do we know that this is a sensitive period for learning? We don't have a lot of great um, human models, but we have a lot of information from animal models that point to this being a really critical period. Yeah, and we also know that the learning systems, the very basic learning systems in the brain that learn things like math and school and things like that are the very same ones that are highly engaged during adolescence. So we can kind of deduce from that the, the importance of this type of learning as well. Other panel members want to chime in on this? I just want to, I, I absolutely agree with what's been stated. And the other part that I'll add is that adolescence is really a time of identity formation. Mm -hmm. It's this critical time period in between, you know, being a child where your parent is telling you, although parents can't always tell their children. But anyways, it's, it's a critical time period between, you know, childhood, like really young childhood, elementary age, and adulthood. And because it's a time of identity formation, they have to form their sexual identity. They have to form their social identity. They really have to contend with these issues and grapple with this so that when they emerge into adulthood, they emerge knowing who they are. And sexual identity, relationships with others, friendships, and sexual relationships, that's part of figuring out who you are. And it's incredibly critical that they figure these things out or really start to figure these things out before they enter adulthood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would just piggyback on what Crystal just said is that it is really this time of individuation where the attachment relationship is really shifting away from parents and becoming more predominant with friends and romantic partners. And so it really is this process of figuring out who, you know, a young person is in and apart from their family and family systems. So just to echo what you said, Crystal, about that important time for learning who they are and the identity development. And I guess I could just say, I mean, to me, it seems like what could be more exciting? And, you know, it's the, the issue is it's like the, the, in addition to all of these com complex, like developmental processes, it's literally the first time. It's like the first time you recognize who you are. It's the first time you imagine yourself right. in a relationship. It's the first time you imagine like what it could be like to do it, to be in love with that person or to have a crush on that person. And um, that's just like thrilling. And, you know, the thing is it's thrilling across the life course. Like we think of it as like special in adolescence. Actually, it's thrilling all the time. It's yeah. just that we're, you know, part of it is that we're experiencing it for the first time and exactly. our, and our neuro, neuro, our brains and our bodies are, uh, are preparing us for that. And that's, exactly. um, what a, what an adventure. And anything that we experience for the first time, any kind of skill that we're trying to acquire for the first time is going to be maybe more exciting, or at least that we're, our brains are paying special attention to that type of learning or that activity because it is the first time. And that's what I think makes it a sense of period for um, love and attachment and a different kind of attachment maybe. Can I just add something, Adriana? Yeah. I also think an interesting thing which Pam touched on is also, it is a period of transition in social relationships, but we still have the advantage that young people do have a lot of social support often from families and parents, and they're not having to navigate and figure it out on their own, that they have somebody who can provide some scaffolding and some support. And I think that that is really critical for why this is a sensitive period, because if young people delay all that exploration until later, they don't have the same type of social support and the same type of infrastructure to navigate some of the complexities. 
And you know what, yeah, Anna, that's perfect. That really leads into the next question I was going to ask, which is how can we as adults support and maximize support young people in maximizing learning around, you know, everything from ranging from crushes to emotional attachment to breakups? How can we scaffold that that learning process for them? Do you want me to start? Or <laughs> Crystal, you start. It looks like she's she's ready to say something. Go ahead. Go ahead, Crystal. Well, I think we can think about this from a couple different ways, and I'm not going to illustrate how from each perspective, but we it's really important um, for us to realize that there are a number of individuals who are supporting the healthy development of young people. There are those of us who are parents. There are those of us who are educators. There are those of us who are researchers and scientists. There are those of us who are community-based peers, you know, like organizations who support young people. There are clinicians. And all of us really have a role to play. And it's important that we play that role. And we're all working together to really support them in becoming healthy adults. And so if we're parents, and I don't know how many individuals who are on this call are parents, we have to kind of take a step back and say, I'm no longer walking in front of them. I'm kind of moving and I'm walking behind them to catch them when they fall and push them along to be their best person. And I think that being their best person includes their relationships with friends, but it also includes healthy relationships, like romantic relationships, because no one wants to have a, a, a their, their person who grows up and, you know, I've never fallen in love before. I've never explored my sexuality. I'm 25 and I have no idea what that looks like. Yeah. So as parents, we have to kind of stay, take a step back and say, I'm, I'm raising healthy adults. I'm raising healthy adults. When we are educators and in community-based organizations, it's important to do that as well. You're watching young people interact with each other in social settings. You're encouraging those healthy relationships and you're calling out what things may not be healthy. So you have an eye on these things. It's not you know, putting a guard up so that they can't have those relationships, but really encouraging healthy, strong relationships and, and calling out the things that um, are happening that may not be healthy. And, and Crystal, just um, a follow-up, how can parents signal to their young person that, um, that they are available for these kinds of relationships, right? Because that's new for parents too. That's a new role that they're taking on. It is, and it's hard. I think the best way to tackle it from my perspective as a parent is to start the conversation early. You're, you're modeling, you're, you're intentional in communicating these things with your child. Like at this particular moment, I'm supporting you to be your best person. I think you should make this decision on your own, but I'm here to support you. Here are some things that you may wanna consider. So communicating to let your child know, I'm here for you, I have your back on this, here are some things you need to figure out and I'm going to support you in this process. So actively letting your child know that I'm, that I'm in this with you and I'm communicating. I'm not assuming that you already know this. Yeah. Yeah, I'd also piggyback on what Chris was saying is, you know, really in, in this time period is like to step, you know, step back as a parent or as, you know, any of other person associated with the young person and, and listen more and talk less. And like you said, Crystal, you know, not making these assumptions about one, what the, your young person that you're supporting is going through and really asking questions that are like curious questions and leading with empathy, because this is so hard for every young person. I mean, we've all been through it, but we don't know what it's like to walk in our young person's shoes. And so really like not trivializing the relationships because I think adults tend to do that. It's like, oh, it'll be over in a couple months, like whatever this puppy love, but these are really unique contexts to learn really important skills. And so if we trivialize this and say, oh, someday you'll figure this out on your own, we are not being and showing up as our best selves to support our young people in the best way that we're able to. So really, you know, that's been my lesson learned, just not even as a professional, but as a parent myself is to, you know, stop talking because I tend to talk too much anyway, and just really having that listening mindset um, to hear what my young person is, is communicating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I think that we, we so, as parents, or people who are parents, we so deeply know our children. And so it is really a wake up call, a little you know, shot in the, you know, of surprise to learn that we don't know everything. And that that's kind of what adolescence is about a little bit, is, is as young people are figuring out who they are and 
developing their own sense of who they are in their life and their life that's increasingly got hours of the day and screen space that's independent of what we know about it and, and understand fully, um, they're figuring it out. And so I think that that listening part becomes so much more important because it's, it can be some, you can really, you know, like many of us, I think, no, we like, oh, I know my kid better than they know themselves. And you realize, oh, oops, I better pay a little bit more attention and a little, listen a little more carefully to kind of what's going on for her right now, mm -hmm. whatever the story might be. I think another really important thing to remember is that, you know, it's not like sexuality starts in adolescence and we are sexual beings throughout our entire lives. Now the, the sexualization of young people clearly starts during puberty. But I think that if we're, if any of us in whatever capacity we're working in are asking ourselves, when should we start talking? The answer is now. We, if you, if we aren't yet, we should should start immediately because there's a real disembodiment that happens for adolescents as they physically go through the secondary, you know, they start developing secondary sex characteristics. They start looking more sexualized and all the adults in their life start shifting the way that they relate to them, whether that's intentionally or not. And um, there's sort of this disembodiment as they're trying to sort of figure out this big new gangly body that they're trying to navigate. Adults off, often also sort of they shift the way they don't hug them the same way. They don't shake hands. There's many more rules that go into how they operate in adult spaces, how they, it may also shift even how they're experiencing their relationships with their parents at home. And so I think really thinking about that trajectory of like, how do we, how do we be mindful in all of our spaces, whether they're professional or personal, how we're relating to young people, how we're supporting their sexual socialization throughout their life course, and really recognizing that this, this sexual development that's occurring during this critical period is it's part of a trajectory. It's not it. It's part of it. And so we have to be thinking about how are we going to support them now? And also, how is that going to lay the foundation for where they're moving on to? That's right. That's right, and that actually um, is is kind of related to a question um, we had from one of our audience members. I know we're going to wait for the end, but this one's really relevant. Is what about the young people who do not have the support from parents or other trusted adults? How do they find this this kind of the support that we're talking about that is so important for the foundational aspects of of love and and other relationships? So. I think um, this is a really important question that, that this audience member raised and I'm really happy they did because it, it reminds us that you, you can't, you really, really have to center the experiences of individuals who may not have everything that other, other individuals have. Um, and from that perspective, I think we as adults shouldn't solely think about our young people. So I shouldn't just be concerned about my child or my students or or the individuals who live on my street or the young people that my organization serves. We should be thinking about young people in general. And conversations, it seems like um, there's a lot of talk around what infants need, like what babies need. The community is always concerned about kids, like little people. And um, when it gets to adolescence, the conversation totally shifts to like, oh my goodness, my teenager has this. And this teenager, can you believe they spoke to me like this? So I think we as adults should be thinking about all young people, really, truly, and listening to all young people, being intentional in how we're interacting with all young people. And um, actually, I'm gonna save this. This is probably going to come up later, so I'm gonna stop okay. talking. Okay. <laughs> Anna? I would just add, I think that, um, you know, I've, I've talked to young people a lot about their, their early romantic relationships and what they, they, they learn a ton from each other. And so young people who are less connected and less supported do often learn an immense amount for better, for worse from their peers. And I will say, actually, I've been really inspired by listening to young people's stories. And so I do think we also, we don't want to leave them on their own entirely. And they also do an incredible job of supporting one another and teaching each other really important things about what is acceptable, what isn't. I think um, for young people who are really detached, if they have if they have supportive peers, I think that they really do learn quite a bit. Stephen, did you? No, no, I, I'm. I'm nodding in agreement. I'm, I'm just nodding in agreement. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, great. 
Um, so given that most of this learning occurs in the context of fears, right, by definition, these types of relationships happen face to face. And clearly we are in a moment when that is not possible. Um, so can you speak a little bit about how the pandemic has influenced romantic relationships or establishing other types of close social bonds? And I'll give you a heads up, a related question will be, um, how can we support this type of healthy development and sexual development and relationships um, when these in you know real life interactions are not possible? Well, I'll, I'll start. Unless, but I, I think it's the one the one thing about pandemic that's important to say I, from me, from my perspective is that I think we focus on the, what's been lost or what's uh, truncated in the context of schools that are closed down and remote learning and being at home. And I think that what's been upended is like our understanding of so many of the dimensions of everybody's life, but especially the life of young people. And what's interesting to me is the degree to which both um, the separate, the physical separation is like painful and difficult and has changed the way that, you know, the possibilities for young people to interact with each other and have typical meaning in person, in real life, everyday relationships. And in some other ways, you know, there are some, there are some uh, cases, some people, some young people for whom this has been a really important time out from, for example, a hostile school space, um, from a, you know, neighborhood that is not a place where they feel like they belong. Um, and so just to, not that that's a good thing, but like, I think that there, there are many ways that this is working its way out through in the lives of young people. And, and so that like, it's not just about isolation. Mm -hmm. And, and, and it turns out, you know, by the way, that young people are actually way better and, 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 and very adaptive with the kinds of tools that we're now all using, like right this moment, to communicate with each other, and have kind of been teaching a lot of us about like, how that can be done in a way that's meaningful. So, you know, I don't mean to be like all, you know, uh, everything's wonderful, but I do think that there are some really interesting ways that the young people in particular are adaptive mm -hmm. in this moment. Um, but that said, I do think that so much of the sort of daily life that was so typical and whether it's like normal is different from whether or not it was just part of the American cultural scene for teenagers of the the contemporary junior high and high school that is was the life of so many people that's clearly been upended mm -hmm. so for people for whom that environment was comfortable and easy and the right thing that has been a real you know can be a source of strain and i'm i'm, not, I'm just highlighting that like it didn't work out well for everybody. for everybody and so there's some people for whom this moment is like a really interesting time to learn new skills learn new strategies for connecting learn trying new things on these things, you know, about how they can uh, connect. And mm -hmm. that, you know, I think we're gonna, five years from now, we're gonna learn, you know, what we didn't know uh, mm -hmm. about, about those possibilities for young people. Mm -hmm. Anna? Um, I, you know, I think I really appreciate you highlighting, St um, Stephen, that there are some benefits. And I'll let you know, listening to adolescent stories um, about this experience has really been heartbreaking about their social relationships. And when I mentioned before the disembodiment, I do think that adolescents are really good at this. They're really good at navigating these virtual spaces. And that doesn't mean that it replaces the in-person connections and they're feeling more two-dimensional than ever before. And I've had young people literally say to me, I've, I've disappeared into a screen. I'm as flat as my computer. Mm -hmm. You know, things like that are just, um, they, they, I think there is a sense of relief for many young people that they're not feeling as much pressure mm -hmm. to whether it's like hug friends in the hallway or express themselves in a certain way. Um, I think that there's a lot of relief and I know that there's a lot of debate in the field, like are young people delaying sexual debut? Is it happening for some, some people it's happening earlier. I think as we all know that the COVID pandemic is exacerbating a lot of existing inequities. It's just re-highlighting them. So we're seeing STD rates rise significantly in certain communities and in other places they're almost disappearing because young people aren't going out. I think that we don't know enough yet, as you said, um, but I do think that we, you know, we really wanna think about young people are, 
trying to work out a lot of this learning in the context of their homes. And so if they're lucky, they have siblings who are similar in age that they have some peer interaction. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, they're often doing it with people who are very developmentally mismatched for them to be engaging in this type of learning. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to work this out with their parents. They may be trying to work it out in other ways. It's It can be stressful on families. Um, and I think that there, there is definitely some protective component to this, but overall, you know, what young people go to middle school for is the drama. They go for the excitement of just meeting people and like getting to know them. And that there's a lot of indi individual variation on how much young people love that, but that's what gets them there every day. It's, it's usually not that they love math so much that that's why they go. And that is like bottomed out from their learning experiences. You know, I will think, I do think that there's some people who have been in romantic relationships during this time. And I've heard parents say that that's the most valuable learning experience they've had is being sheltered in place with a partner and like really working out, like if this is going to be your person, this is what this looks like. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's benefits, but I think we do have to be acutely aware of how much support young people are going to need as they return to school, as they return to these social environments. Young people are incredibly anxious about the potential of returning and having to reassume that like they have to rebody themselves. They have to get back in their skin and go out in the world. And that is terrifying. Mm -hmm. And so I think we also need to be really specific. We need to be thinking strategically about where in somebody's development they're experiencing this. And I do think our early adolescents, our 10 to 14 year olds who are experiencing this now are the most vulnerable in their trajectories of where they're headed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that, Anna, because, you know, just as we we're talking about like this process of individuation, I mean, the very young adolescents, the 10 to 14 year olds are stuck at home with their families in this time that they are primed to be detaching to them. And so I'm sure there's a lot of strife that's happening. There's a lot of, you know, I think it's happening kind of unskillfully because they're not quite skilled at this. So the venting of the emotions and the frustrations, it can look like, you know, silence, it can be abrasive, it can be aggressive, it can be emotional, it can be all of those things, right? And then obviously the parents, and and whoever you're at home with is like, you know, it's that reciprocation of like, what is happening here? But I also think, you know, that like the middle school context or like school activities or clubs or other community-based activities that young people are involved in, you know, yeah, they might be drawn to it because they like whatever the activity is, but it's what you said, Anna, about having that opportunity to engage with other people to learn, you know, how do you deal with different authority figures? How do you handle different dynamics in a group setting? How do you negotiate boundaries? And so, that, like you said, it really is dependent now in this pandemic who you are housed with and whether you have those opportunities. And so I really appreciate you saying that, you know, really having to get back into their skin as that we re-enter not just young people but all of us right and and trying to understand what those dynamics are how we're going to interact with one another um, there's just a lot of learning that is happening now but it's happening outside of the context that they're normally happening in mm -hmm. and is one of thank you pam that's that's great um is one of the reasons that um, young people are, um, you know, saying that they're feeling that they're not getting the, the social needs that they have met, is it because now their bubbles are more, I don't mean their physical bubbles, I mean the people that they interact with, they're not meeting new people, or what, what is exactly is it that, that they're not getting from the social media space? Crystal? So we, the young people who we work with, I think, I think this is such a fascinating conversation because um, for, me, for me, it illustrates that we have different pockets of young people who are experiencing this pandemic differently. Mm -hmm. For a lot of the young people that we work with, we're hearing that they are really deepening their relationships with their peers. They're really figuring out this person who I thought was my really close friend, it was a really superficial friendship. This other person who, you know, we kind of pass each other in the hallway, we actually have a lot in common and can communicate for long periods of time about things that really matter. So when you ask about, you know, how does this, how does this affect their, their relationships with others or why is it difficult? I think that they are getting this, this really intense crash course into relationships aren't solely superficial in the way that they could be when you just kind of see each other or pass each other in the hallway or go to the dance or go to the game. This is pressure 
and an opportunity because a lot of the young people say, you know, it's really an opportunity to get to know the real person. And this is for romantic relationships and for friendships. And more importantly, to get to know who they are. So back to that identity formation, when you are limited to interactions on a screen and on a telephone, you really can hone in to who you are, what your priorities are. And I mean, honestly, taking a step back and looking at what's happening around them, what's happening in our world, the superficial relationships, the superficial conversations, adolescents aren't really into that. Young people are really not into that. They are into this justice. Let's talk about what's going on. I don't have time for these other things. Look what's happening to the world around us. So this pandemic where people are at home yeah. combined with what's happening in the world <laughs> around us, the country that we're living in, it really elevates the depth of those relationships or it has the opportunity to elevate the depth of those relationships. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me if you think about like human history, the idea of the middle school is really a, a perverse mm -hmm. <laughs> structure in my view. Like my, you know, like for the course of human history until the last two, 300 years, 200 years, 150 years, we, we didn't live in such age, age segregate. We didn't spend so much of our days and radically, not even just a little bit age segregated, but like you're literally within 12 months of age <laughs> of everyone around you for most of the time of your day. And so yeah. I actually, you know, I think maybe it will be, maybe, you know, maybe the radical possibility of the pandemic, maybe young people will lead us back to thinking of not returning to that suit up for middle school experience again. I <laughs> mean, maybe that's a possibility. Like I, I almost hate that we have to imagine returning to the, to, the normativity of the of, of the U.S. American and maybe other places too, but I'll just limit to what you know, to of the of the high school and the junior high school, maybe it doesn't have to be. And you know, maybe it's, maybe it's possible that young people like the the the, the possibilities that Crystal talks about for young that, that the young people that she knows are who are engaging you know with each other in a in a different sort of way, maybe they'll be able to teach us how to blend that into a new in-person real life and this kind of real life reality, um, mm -hmm. which would be really, I mean, that's kind of what I, I sort of believe that we need that, you know, to some, some, some space between it, maybe the pandemics are giant reboot. For everybody. Anna, go ahead. I just wanted to say, I, I really appreciate Crystal mentioning the diversity in experiences because that is really very, so true. I mean, I've talked to young people who actually life is completely normal. They're going to school full time. They're having normal experiences. They're playing sports with their families. They're really not sheltered. And I've talked to those people here in the United States. And then I've talked to people who haven't been outside of their house for nine months, literally, because their neighborhoods are not safe enough. And so I think there is a huge breadth of experience. And I think um, one thing that really sticks with me and Stephen, I embrace your vision that something like revolutionary happens to transform education as a result of this. I'm concerned that it's gonna be, let's be online all the time and I'm hoping we don't go there, but um, I, I love your vision. And I, you know, I think the other thing that sticks with me though, a 13 year old young woman said to me, the thing is, is all I do is spend time with people who think like me. I never meet anybody who thinks differently than I do or challenges me in any way. And as my circle has shrunk, I have, um, I reinforce what I already know and what I already believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really important thing for us to be thinking about that it is what this pandemic has done for all of us is it makes our circles tighter. And it may be that we have people in those circles, but because of the simultaneous political environment um, and many of the social issues that have come up, people are sticking to their, to like, and it's, it's exacerbating the division in this country. And I think that that is a really critical thing that we need to be thinking about as we're moving forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I we have so many questions from, from the audience. So I think we're going to turn to some of them. So, um, the, the, you know, some of the themes may not flow as nicely as they have, but um, I'll do my best to, to group them. Um, so there are a few questions about um, how can we um, support young people in this sexual um, romantic development space based on ethnicity and gender. Um, any thoughts about that? Crystal? 
So I will say, um, well, first I'll say at CI3, a lot of our work focuses on black and brown young people and we're located in Chicago on the south side of Chicago. So there are a number of racial, ethnic and socioeconomic dynamics that are happening. Mm -hmm. um, also, if anyone looks at the news, there's a narrative around Chicago that um, is fascinating. It's conversation for another day. But um, all this is to say that young people uh, from the southwest, south and west sides of Chicago, because that's who we primarily serve, have very strong opinions about how other people view them. Mm. And um, it could be from the adultification of black and brown young, young women, um, viewing them as, as older women when they're 10 or 11, or the adultification of, of young men who might be 10 or 11, but they're viewed as adults and treated as adults by law enforcement or teachers or, or anyone else. So I think in terms of what we can do, we can remember that yes, these are adolescents who are in a period of change and they're becoming young adults, but we have to be very conscious of the biases that we have, um, try to be more conscious of the biases that we have about adolescents from different um, racial or ethnic groups. And we also have to be conscious about any biases that we have about gender norms and, and how we grew up with these just binaries. Binaries are not what's in. No young person wants to hear you talk about binaries. Um, that's not how they view themselves. Please let us not try to put that on them. Mm -hmm. They don't like that. Stephen? I mean, I, I think Crystal said that's also well. I mean, I, I think of it from the perspective of LGBTQ kids, young people, and I think so many there is such a, you know, there is not any way to describe a singular experience of that, and right, and especially now, and that and because there are so many communities and so many families and so many people are in different places on that, and it is absolutely the case that there are still people who fear for their safety and well-being coming out in their families or in their schools, and there are other places where that's just not part of anybody's imagination because it's just not that way anymore in that place. But everybody lives in this place where the master culture is still working it out. I mean, or we wouldn't even still be having the conversation. So, um, you know, I think that the, the in that case, it's like, how do we, you know, just continue to, to, to have voice, give voice to the possibilities that everybody has for the kind of fulfilling and meaningful relationship that they want to have in their life. And um, I think, you know, the, 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 simple, the simple answer is we just have to, be you know committed to and then to, to, to illuminating and possibilities for young people uh, in their own lives. And I think you know the more complicated thing is how do we support families that aren't there yet, and mm -hmm. um, how do we support young people in those families if the family's not there yet? And yeah. uh, that's another whole long webinar conversation, right? But I mean, I think that meeting people where they are. There was a question I saw scroll through about you know religious background or yeah. conservative religious communities. Like how do we both you know, most people, almost all people that are parents or teachers or, or community members want kids to be happy. We almost all want that. Like there's very few truly evil people that just want, you know, people to fail. And so like, how do we meet people where they are to understand what that means to them and help? And I think this is what the science, this is my, you know, relentless optimism about the science is that science can help make, connect the dots to say, you know, we all do want the same outcome. Here's what we know that will make a difference for helping that, helping us achieve that uh, for, for every kid. And, um, and maybe your, your fund of knowledge that came from your space or your specific you know, cultural faith belief or community or personal experience isn't aligned with what we know will actually be the, you know, be the way to fully deeply support you know, their true selves. Um, and, I, and I actually think most people, you know, can come around. Um, so I think it's, you know, understanding where people are and trying to then do that balance of supporting young people and supporting the systems that they live in. Yeah. Um, oh, I, I, the only thing that I was going to add to that is just to really echo Stephen's point, just say, you know, it's a constant re-education, you know, 
constantly about what it means to be a young person growing up today, right? Because we bring our biases from what it was like growing up during our time. And that does not fit with today's, you know, and what young people are experiencing and, and what they're bringing forward. And so I think it is, it has been and will continue to be this need to have a paradigm shift and for us to always be advocating for young people in a way that, you know, they're not being looked at as, you know, people to be threatened, you know, and to be threatened by or to, and we just need to be mindful of what young people can bring forward rather than this like period of like storm and stress that, you know, it's this old town way of thinking about young people. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I think that uh, there are a few questions about um, LGBTQ um, de sexual development. And Stephen, maybe you touched on this a little bit and said we could talk about it forever, but how best to support young people who may be in communities where, um, you know, they're, they're not supported? That's, boy, that's a huge, how, how I, do support, I mean, you know, you know, meet, like be be the person that can be their, you know, their their grounding. I, I, I'm trying to I'm trying to double take and look in the chat and see what yeah. people are asking. But I mean, I think it's it's so it is it it's so variable based on the person. I mean, we know what makes a difference in schools, yeah. for example. We know that like explicit, supportive, inclusive policies and laws, you know, state and federal laws for non discrimination and inclusion. We know that communities, schools that are uh, that have inclusive policies and then inclusive practices in their books and their libraries and their curriculum in the interactions between you know adults and young people. Mm -hmm. We know that those places are places where young people are feel safer and do better, have higher achievement and, and you know have better mental health, for example. We have a really good now, like after 10 years, we have really good solid population science that tells us that this is not, this is not. We just need the public will to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, so I, you know, I think one of the, what can we do? We can become advocates, you know, we can become the people that are engaged in, does my school have an inclusive yeah. non-discrimination policy? Are the teachers in my school district where I live, uh, you know, offer the, you know, required or even just offer the ability for professional development training related to understanding young people from all kinds of different backgrounds and all mm -hmm. kinds of different experiences. Mm -hmm. And so those are, the, I think that they're, I think, you know, in some other writing I've done, I've felt like parenting would, you know, radical parenting would mean that all of us would be responsible for advocating for all of the young people mm -hmm. <laughs> in our, that would be parenting when we really fully uh, I think this is like similar to what Kristen was saying. When we when we really fully deeply care for everyone's kids, and imagine what those kinds of communities would look like. So, I mean, it's it's too simple, and it's it's so complicated on an individual case, you know. Because the truth is, I can say all this stuff, but I need my kid to be safe now, like right. this afternoon today. Mm -hmm. and so, like, what do we do about that? Um, and that's it's but like I, yeah. yeah. I think it comes back to what you started with that this isn't just an individual to individual. Um, solution or problem, right? It's really about the systems and the structures in which these kids yeah. are are being reared, and that's beyond the home, and that's um, equally important, and that's where the advocacy advocacy comes in, right? Yeah, and I think there's been a little bit of danger in the last couple of years, for especially after uh, 2015 and the Supreme Court decision on, you know, equality for marriage, that I think there's, I know because I hear a lot that like, aren't we done with that? You know, I mean, although maybe the last several years we've learned that we weren't really fully done with that. <laughs> but um, I, I think that there is a, I think a lot of well-meaning people think, oh, we're sort of, you know, like we thought for so many years, you know, after the civil rights movement that we were post-race and we have we had started to think to ourselves that we were post-homophobia. And I think what you know is so clear <laughs> is that that's, you know, that's not the case and that we need to continue to, you know, analyze, be yeah. critical, discern how our, our own values, our community practices um, for young people. So. Yeah. yeah. Can, I, can I add to that? Yeah, please. Um, I first, first I want to reinforce um, and thank you for bringing this up again, Stephen, that it's not that the first thing we need to do is recognize that these aren't those kids over there who need those special things. These are our kids. This is our community. We need to make these things work for them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we are not there. We've realized, we've recognized that we're not there. So instead of just saying we're, we're not really there yet, you know, 
we need to be envisioning what, what there is and we should be working towards that vision. We need to articulate, this is what inclusive looks like. It's not an asterisk and then somewhere down here on the document that says, for you, you go over there. Yeah. Inclusive is my, my pronouns are she, her. They're the, the pronouns that you might expect me to have, but I name my pronouns because I want to make sure that you feel comfortable naming your pronouns. And I want to call out that this is something that, that I do to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. So it's really saying, I'm not just going to put this as a, as a thing on the side in the corner. We're, We're going to incorporate this into what we do. This is how we talk. This is how we work. Um, and our queer youth, they need to feel included. And I think that um, for schools and parents and, and community organizations, we need to do a better job of showing them what inclusivity looks like because um, the media may sensationalize these things. They'll, and, and if you really follow the media, you'll get caught up in, should that person be partic participating in that track activity if they have, like, that's not what this is about. Mm -hmm. this, this, isn't, this isn't just about that. So let's not boil it down to that thing. Let us make this an inclusive, how do we make sure that all young people who are our young people, they're ours, we're all in the same community. How do we make sure that generally speaking, we are including, name it, call it out, articulate what it looks like in everyday activities. I think people will be better able to do it if they see that it's not an add-on. It's mm -hmm. not an asterisk. It's just the way that you behave mm -hmm. as a good human being. Yeah. Thank you. Well said. Okay. I was just, uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add, I think that this is also such a perfect opportunity for us to follow the youth, sort of as both Crystal and Pamela have highlighted. I think this is a space, uh, particularly around LGBTQ Q youth and then um, youth of various groups. Like there is some, they've been doing some amazing things to create community during this time. And so I think that learning from them and, and supporting their leadership, I think is a really great opportunity for us. And I do think that as everybody's been talking about, as we come back to school, we're going to have to be innovative as young people return to more traditional learning environments. And this is an opportunity for us to be looking more critically at intersectionality and how that influences young people. You know, they're not just coming back from the experience of COVID, but they're also coming back from the experience of wildfires and hurricanes and racial violence and incredible, you know, upheaval in their communities. And we need to be looking at how do we bring all of that back together. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit um, and ask um, Bertie's questions. She's uh, had some really good ones. So I'm gonna read exactly what she wrote. I've read some of the panelists work which describes adolescence as a period of play in the romantic realm, much like childhood was about learning through play in, in the cognitive domain. What is the sensitive window for that play? Is that moderated by pubertal timing and tempo? I think you should just let Bertie answer this question herself. Because <laughs> <laughs> I would call her. But um, <laughs> I do think that what we know is that that play is a really important part of puberty. And that um, if you look at animal models that um, that rodents and other animals, they actually handicap themselves to keep the game going. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that parallel in humans, that's what adolescents do. They handicap themselves to keep the dynamic going. So whether it's the drama that they have with their friends, you know, they're, they're always trying to pull people back in. They're trying to increase the, the excitement, the enthusiasm. They're, they're always looking for opportunities to do that. And I think that it looks very different in a human model. They're not necessarily wrestling on the ground, but they are, um, they are doing things socially to handicap themselves. And I think that this is some of the things that we see when young people um, yeah, we know that young people, they like excitement, they like arousal, they like fear in ways that are unique to adolescents. Mm -hmm. And I think that this, like this, this fun, playful dynamic, they get a lot of, a lot of um, reward from engaging in that type of, of dynamic play. And I do think that there's some really interesting questions about if they don't get that then, what does that mean further on in their trajectory? And I think we're doing a real natural experiment to see that right now, because a lot of young people have had that dynamic of play, that interplay with their peers taken away in a pretty profound way. Yeah. And um, 
I think it will likely give us some, you know, we'll be able to have some retrospective insights about what does it mean if young people don't have that opportunity, but we do know that this is a sensitive period. That actually relates to a question another um, audience member had. What is our source for identifying what it means to be a good adult in the sense of good, acceptable love and relationships? This is, he writes, this seems to reflect the norms of the day. Who's to say we adults are living the best life or being our best selves? As adolescent researchers, are you trying to import your knowledge of good normative behavior on adolescents or vice versa? Crystal. The adolescents tell us if we're being good and supportive adults, all we have to do is ask. Mm -hmm. And to go to the point of play, I absolutely echo that. And um, to link this to an earlier question of what do we do to support adolescents, at our center, we make games that educate them about these sorts of things. We make games that teach them how to navigate these waters. And funny enough, we make them with adolescents. So we know they're fun because they've tried them out, they've co-designed them with us, and they tell us, yes, this is exactly what we need in order to tackle this issue. And so it's still possible to bring this play into the environment that we're in now. Just make a game, make it digital. Adolescents, young people, they'll do anything if it's a game. They really will. So educators, if you need games and ideas to have these conversations, let me know. We've got you covered. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really interesting philosophical question. I mean, I, obviously there's not an answer to that, to that, you know, what is the source? What does it mean to be a good person? And I love the, I love the provocative, like our, our researchers and, and thinkers being, you know, from, 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 you know, advocating for some kinds of normativities. Yeah. And I guess I would say, um, you know, I hope that people call us out when we are. And in the meantime, uh, as long as the normativity is about, as, as long as we developed a culture of normativity around inclusion, bring it on. <laughs> I'm all for that. Like, I, I'm, I'm okay with being transparent about like, as long as the normativity is an anti-racist, anti-sexist, anti-ageist, anti-homophobic uh, uh, normativity, then I'm all for imagine, you know, creating that as the, the goal post, uh, uh, gold ring, whatever the thing is you're supposed right. to say, uh, for adulthood and for adolescents too. So, mm -hmm. but it's, a really, it's an interesting provocative thought. Um, it is. It reminds me of the question that comes up a lot in um, adolescent risk-taking literature. Um, who is it risk taking for, right? Like we define, we say that adolescents engage in behaviors that are health compromising or whatnot. Um, but if your goal is to be a part of a social group, maybe sometimes taking a risk is actually very adaptive and a normative part of your development. So um, it is it's a really provocative question. Honor, Pam, did you want to add anything to it? Uh, I mean, I was just going to say really quickly that, you know, I think to Crystal's point is that young people will call out hypocrisy whenever they see it and they will do it loudly and they will do it proudly. And so if they and and they're watching as much as they're listening. And so, I mean, it really is upon us as, you know, humans to, you know, do what is right. And and I guess that is part of that provocative question of like, what is your right? So mm -hmm. is it aligned with your values? Is it aligned with, you know, your beliefs? I mean, truly just living what is right for you and then living that. I was just going to add, I think I, I also love this question. And I think that it's an important reminder that romantic relationships are super difficult and complex for everybody. Romantic and sexual relationships, I don't I don't know a lot of adults that are good at it or that they even could say like, what I'm holding up is the gold standard of what we should be. I don't think we have an answer for it about what we're trying to get people to. And so I think it is really important to be thinking about this, this more holistic um, perspective of, you know, Adulthood is about being able to assume the right roles and roles and responsibilities of being a, ma a mature adult. Mm -hmm. And I think that we have to be really flexible about what this is, particularly when it comes to sexuality and when it comes to romantic relationships, because it is a journey. They're messy, they're complex throughout, throughout life. And 
I think that that is a really important thing for us to be honest with young people about because they're never going to get perfect at it. I mean, if, if somebody out there is, is, if you're perfect at it, please let me know because I want to <laughs> know what it looks like. But I think that that just that honesty is really important that there isn't this optimal thing. And I think we do have to look really critically at the standards that we set, whether it's like thinking about marriage or thinking about, we have these weird social constructs that have been tied to sexuality and to gender identity and to, and to romantic relationships that have made them even more difficult to navigate. And I think that we need to be really thoughtful about them. We only have five minutes and unfortunately we couldn't get to all the questions, but I do want to end on a really great one. The question is, can you talk more about love? I'll talk about love. <laughs> I love love. <laughs> um, you know, I think we don't know much about love. You know, I, I really dove into like the neuroimaging literature on love and what we know about it. And we know that there's probably some different neural responses to romantic versus platonic love to, to maternal love. Um, we know a little bit from adult models, but we actually really don't know what it is. And I think that that is, um, you know, love can be so many things. And I think it's what it is, is it's a quest. It's what we're all seeking. Mm. That's romantic, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say that if we want to know what love is, ask a two-year-old or a three-year-old, what, what do you think love is? And they will illustrate it in a way that's so typical for a two-year-old or three-year-old, but um, so true. So really, really, really true. And um, I think that we as adults may not necessarily be able to articulate it as well as, as really, really, really young people as two-year-olds or three-year-olds are. But I do think that we should continuously ask the adolescents in our lives, um, what, what is love to you? What do you think this is? What's, what's happening with this friendship and relationship? Do you think this is love? How do you know? Um, because these are things that really get them thinking about what it is they want from relationships. Are you even looking for love? If you're not, that's okay. Um, have conversations around this. This is so, so important to a healthy relationship, healthy development. It's not all about sex. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes it is, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. So including love in conversations about relationships, it's, it, it really rounds it out and it's so important. Yeah. And I keep hearkening back to, you know, being curious and asking the questions, but truly like what we are constantly asking young people that we work with is, you know, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? And really getting them onto all of those different like sensorial levels to be able to truly be able to start to just notice it and be able to articulate those pieces. But also, Crystal, to your point, I mean, two, three, four, five-year-olds, I mean, they will tell you everything about love. And then, you know, you ask the same thing of, you know, very young 